What's the high temperature tomorrow? Tomorrow, expect a high of 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeesh. Well, hey there. Welcome to whatever this is. I was planning on doing a video today talking about some of the electrical system on the bus as far as how it's possible to live and never pull more than 1,450 watts from the grid. But I think we're gonna have to postpone that. I had to buy a new generator because reasons I'll explain, but it's currently extremely hot and has been for the last three days. Uh, I don't know if you can see here. Currently 101 and a half outside and 85 in here. The trick is this 85 degrees is directly in front of that air conditioner. And I've got the editing laptop there cooling it back down. If we move up here into the rest of the bus, it's 94 degrees. So I don't really have the energy or mental capacity to go into all the details in a topic that was going to involve drawings and a whole bunch of other stuff. So what we're gonna do instead is basically look at this new generator I bought. I'll explain why I bought it and what it's being used for, but uh, we kinda go deep down into the rabbit hole here and blather on about a whole bunch of generator related stuff and breaking it in and testing it and all those things. So anyways, um, hopefully you enjoy. Okay, well, we're out here at the warehouse. I, um, Sony stereo noises. I had to come out and buy another generator because, well, it's currently 109 right here outside. And when that happens where the bus is parked, the power grid gets extremely unreliable. I do have a generator, but if that thing happens to fail for whatever reason, the inside of the bus will be up over 115 degrees within about 20 minutes. So we need a backup. Um, so anyways, came out to pick this thing up at the usual scumbags, big orange box store. And now we're out here at the warehouse because I think the modem overheated and I have to reset it. And well, we were in the area, so let's go see. Well, we've made it back. Here's this thing. I don't know if you can tell by the color of that sunlight, but um, air quality is not super good out here right now. It's still currently 102 degrees and it's about 7.30 at night. Only supposed to get down to 70, which means I'm gonna have to run the AC late into the night. Normally, the way this works, about this time of day or a little sooner, I turn it off and start charging the inverter batteries, but that's where this thing comes in. So we're gonna, Continue running the AC on the grid. We're gonna get this thing set up, get it broken in. Um, yeah, it's, it's, got, it's got the blue teeth and stuff. Ooh, I wonder if I can pull this thing into Home Assistant. That would be cool. All right, anyways, I'm gonna get this thing open back up, see what's going on in there, and then uh, we'll get to unpacking this. By the way, one of the reasons I got that thing is kind of for backup purposes, because when it gets this hot out, the power grid here gets pretty unreliable. And also, the other generator is mounted to a power chair base and it's stored in the green van. It's a huge production and it's really difficult for me to load and unload that. Plus, that thing being portable and me being able to pick it up and move it means if I have to bail and there's no power and I have to take it with me, I can take it with me. And yeah, don't have to worry about the power chair base and all that. Ooh, it's cooled off a little bit in the last five minutes. So it's 98 outside now. All right, cool. 88 in here, that's acceptable. I'm gonna make some coffee, probably get a cold beverage. I'll tell you, there is nothing like sparkly water. I think my inverter batteries are starting to show their age. It's a little flickery, but we're at 23.8 volts. I have not been here all day, and the only thing running is basically the fridge, you know, I guess, and the ice maker, but we're already down that low. So yeah, let's get the generator set up. Okay, let's see what we got. 
going on in here. Yeah, so this thing's not like small by any means, but I can lift it if I need to. Well, I will need to, but anyways. It's like we've got a spark plug wrench here. And, ooh, it came with oil, excellent. Should be a funnel and some other things in here maybe. Okay, there's the thing. Actually, I should probably stop this music because copyright. There we go. So as you can see, compared to me, it's not small, but you can also move it around. Apparently did not come with a funnel to get the oil in there. So I'm gonna look through the manual here real quick and see what it has to say about things. Oh, it's a road map. Okay, let's get this thing up here where you can actually see it. Get some oil in it and stuff. Yeah, apparently it was inspected by upside down V or something. People complained about this on YouTube that this screw is too long. Um, I mean, it didn't seem that long to me. Yeah, I got some nice insulation. Got a little engine in there. So according to the instructions, you're supposed to add this entire bottle. Oh, it does have a one-use funnel. I don't know what brand this is. It did come with it, so I think the idea might be to run this stuff for a few hours and then change it with something else. People claim that, you know, breaking in engines these days is unnecessary. Oh, that was loose. But I don't know, still something I like to do. It looks like it's had some oil in there at some point. It smells like new generator. Look, look at the cute little funnel. So let's see, what is this stuff? Premium, uh, 12 fluid ounces. Yeah, well, down the hatch, I guess. Whoa, that stuff's a weird color. And it's already dripping out. Yeah. Oh, it looks like there's a little catch tray down there. So it might be the tiniest bit over full, but I think it's okay. We're also kind of sitting at a weird angle here, so I'm just gonna screw the lid on and call it a day. Let's get some gas a in here. Actually, I'm gonna just kind of check some of this stuff for no reason. Oh, there's our inverter down there. Hmm. Cable management leaves something to be desired in here. Mm. These are those gas cans that I absolutely hate. So let's see if this thing is just gonna completely ruin our day or not. I think you're supposed to, hang on, let me leak check. I think you're supposed to just put them on like this and then send it. Yeah, there we go. That should be enough to do something. Now supposedly the whole awesome selling feature of this thing is this control panel here that has like Bluetooth connectivity and all kinds of stuff. We've got a couple of outlets there, USBs. Who would fire up a generator to charge their phone? Uh, whatever. Oh yeah, it's got a carbon monoxide detector, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, I guess we will turn some knobs and see if this will start. Okay, it's a little hard to tell with microphones and stuff how loud something is, but um, I could I could easily have a conversation next to this thing. I think this runs it up to 4,500 RPM, which I'm sure makes it louder. That's still not bad at full throttle. Okay, well, I'm gonna let this thing idle for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, something like that. Uh, open up the side panel, check for leaks, all that fun stuff, and then I'll be back. And we've got a cord over here that we can whack a load into this thing with and uh, see how it performs. Hmm, I heard something fall off inside of it, and I tipped it up just now, and I heard something sliding around at the bottom. Uh, yeah, something definitely sliding around in there. Hmm. Okay, we've removed some screws and this knob. Let's see. Yeah. Can't really see much in there. Um, man, 
This wiring really needs to be tied down in this thing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to dig into this a little further, figure out what that is. Okay, we got some screws out of the front control panel here. And that gives us access to our wiring. Of course, I still can't really see the bottom of this thing. Well, since we're already in here, I guess I might as well. Oh yeah, look at that. See that yellow wire? It's just like up against the front of the engine. And there's like some sharp metal bracketry in here. Yeah, since we're in here already, I'm gonna go ahead and fix up some of this wiring. Uh, I'm gonna find that part, get this cleaned up, and then I'll be back. All right, we're mid repairs here. I've got some of the cloth wiring loom tape. These are our main output wires here, and they're like riding up against sharp metal edges. So I'm going through and kind of bundling stuff together and zip tying things in place. But our inverter batteries are getting low now, and well, I'm gonna have to pull the, uh, the big generator out of the van, I guess, and hook it up. There's not enough time to break this thing in and get it fixed and get it plugged in. So anyways, let's get that set up real quick and then we'll continue working on this. And it's starting to get dark out here too. Okay, it's kind of hard to show, but I went through and added zip ties in areas like this and like this and kind of bundled stuff together back there and also added some of uh, the cloth tape material to a few things. So I think we should be good now. I kind of forgot though, I haven't looked for whatever that part is that's banging around on the bottom of this thing. So I want to see if I can find that real quick and then uh, go from there. Yay. I was not expecting to take apart a brand new, uh, how much was this thing? 700 bucks? I wasn't expecting to pull apart a $700 generator and redo their wiring, but I don't know. It's just how stuff is these days. So I just spent a bunch of time taking this whole end cap off, thinking it would give me access to the inside. Nope. Whatever is sliding around in here is right down inside this area. Whatever it is, I heard it fall off and drop down in there while it was running. Everything else seems to be attached, so I don't know. I might just give up and put it back together. Okay, I give up. I was worried it was something from the engine maybe, or like some sort of fastener, but it's all the way up here in the very front cover. Only thing I can think of is maybe it's like one of the mounting screws that holds the inverter circuitry in there. It seems to be pretty solidly mounted, so I'm just not gonna worry about it for now, whatever. We've got wire sheathing on everything now. Things are kind of tucked up in here, a lot nicer than they were. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna run it, whatever. Oh look, it's the next day. So we have a little bit of time before the sun ends up over here which I think should be enough. So we're working on the break-in procedure in this thing. I didn't really go over that, but the idea is you run the thing at full throttle for about an hour, shut it off, change the oil, run it again. I normally do like maybe a half hour or something like that, then change the oil a second time. Then you can load the thing up and actually run it for a few hours at about maybe 50 to 75% load, and that should complete the break-in process. The problem is, well, not the problem, but the way these things work, they have a splash lubrication oil system. So there's no oil pump, there's no filter, there's no, you know, oil paths and everything like that. Basically, the crank comes around, hits a puddle of oil in the bottom and splashes it around everywhere. But when these things first wear in, there's going to be some metal debris and particles and stuff like that. So you want to get that out of there and change the oil a couple of times. This thing just finished running for about an hour at full throttle. We're gonna open this up, see what's gonna take to change the oil in this thing. And then also, I wanna get some of the stickers off this thing. This thing is completely sticker slapped. And honestly, the lime green color kinda screams steal me, so we might have to do something about that too. But anyways, oil change. Oh! Okay, this is actually kinda cool. So if you look down in here, there's a little tray underneath that. So when you tip this thing to the side, yeah, see, there's like uh, like some little guides down there. And then right here, we have a, like a little spout that comes out. Okay, cool. That's actually really neat for changing oil on this thing. 
And then, oh yeah, look at that. Oh, look how dark it is. Do you remember how clear that oil was when we first poured it in here? So yeah, break-in procedure, definitely something you want to do and then change the oil right away. Man, this oil's like water. It claimed it was 1030, but dude, that stuff just came with is horrific. I do have some Rotella T4 we're gonna put in here. It's also 1030, much better oil, I believe. So yeah, so there's the difference after running for just an hour. Good not to have all that in there. It's totally fine that that stuff is worn off and is suspended in the oil, but that's the idea of oil. You wanna trap the dirt and debris and then get it out of there. So we're gonna to top this off with some good oil. Run it again for another hour, change it one more time. And if for nothing else, it's extremely difficult to get all of the oil out of this style of crankcase. So changing it a couple times will help flush the rest of that out of there. Fast forward one hour and it's time for oil change number two. Yeah, not nearly as dark as the last time. Again, the idea here is to flush as much of the break-in debris as possible out of the engine. So that's why we're changing it here. And it's getting hot out here. Haven't looked at the temperature, but sitting in direct sunlight is probably not the best thing to be doing. So according to the internet, and my eyeballs, I think this is a Honda engine. It sounds like a Honda. It looks like a Honda. I know there are larger generators, like the four or five kilowatt one uses like a straight up GX 430 or whatever it is engine. The smaller ones, I couldn't find exact information, but all the documentation stuff I can find, like unofficial reviews and things, claim that it's all Honda. So is this, hang on, there's like this seal in here that looks a little weird, like an air seal. Oh yeah, there's a, ow, hot. There's a rubber airflow seal in here that has popped out of place. If I can push that back in here. Okay, um, I'm gonna get this cleaned up, get out of the sun. We're gonna set this up somewhere in the shade and hit it with a load, run it for a while and profit, I guess. Okay, we got the thing sitting here on eco idle mode or auto throttle or whatever. Got it underneath this table just to keep the sun off the gas tank and stuff. We're gonna use the iPad here with Home Assistant, uh, enable some loads and see what happens. Let's go ahead and hit it with the inverter battery charger as well. This one should be instant. Let's go inside and look at the voltmeters and uh, like uh, the Hertz counter and all that and see what we're doing. With our transfer switch engaged, this outlet should be connected directly to the generator. The screen is kind of hard to see. Turn on the lights on my chair maybe. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so we got 120.4 volts and exactly 60 Hertz. So yeah, that's not doing too bad. Cool. By the way, there's a couple of versions of these things. Um, actually, I might leave this plugged in. It has a little like NIMH battery inside of it that will charge up. There is a version of this that has a backlight. I forget exactly the reason behind it, but you don't want to buy the one with the backlight. Anyways, I will, does this have a model number on it? But I'll put an Amazon associate link down below. These things are pretty handy. And with that battery in there, well, even without the battery being charged, they have non-volatile memory. So you can leave these plugged in, do data logging. You can calculate cost. You can put in your electricity price. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's a really cool, little piece of uh, test gear or whatever. But yeah, for right now, I'm just gonna leave it plugged in so that battery in there charges up. Actually, I haven't used this thing in several months. Yes, I'm filming with the iPad. So on my phone here, Ryobi has this little app. Hang on, can I focus this? It's touching the iPad with my nose. Anyways, it's a little blurry. As you can see here, we've got the fuel level, which is actually pretty granular. I like that feature. And it uses that to calculate the load and the amount of runtime at the current level. 
and you can see our wattage here is changing just a little bit as time goes on. You can also set a shutdown timer. So if you want the thing to turn off after a certain amount of time, uh, you can do that. Then you can go into the settings here and you can have it run at like the eco idle where basically the engine RPM matches the load. It saves a lot of fuel that way, but you can turn that on and off there. And then you can see like the total number of hours the thing has been running. Anyways, it's it's, it's kind of cool. Shows a lot of show, uh, shows a lot of neat stuff. This one doesn't have the battery built in with the electric starter, so you can shut it down remotely, but you can't start it remotely. But anyways, kind of cool. Okay, we are. I think this is what day two now that we're running this thing. Regardless, the uh, the end of this extension cord on the inside is getting kind of old and starting to melt. So I went and bought some replacement ends. So we're just gonna disconnect this thing out here, go inside, replace that, and get it fired back up. All right, problem I noticed today when I went to plug in this little adapter thing, there was sort of some green slimy plastic on the prongs. And I was noticing yesterday too that this thing was starting to get kind of warm. So I think seeing as how this thing is a number of years old and you can see there's kind of some weird green stuff going on down in there. Actually, uh, if we put this end on here, it might not be long enough. Well, regardless, we got to replace this. But went down to the hardware store, got one of these thermoplastic replacement um, receptacle thingies. Looks like a pretty simple setup. Now we have completely unplugged this from the outside, so it's not connected to anything, which means when I do this, bad things shouldn't happen. Well, assuming I can do that. Ha, there we go. Ah, the old box cutter. My least favorite implement for not springing a leak. Man, this cord has all kinds of fluffy stuff inside of it. It's like a snowstorm. Ah, this thing is actually designed kind of cool. There's, there's little holes so you can just stick the wires straight down in there and then there's plates that you clamp down over them. That makes it kind of nice. Okay, let's go ahead and get these things in here. The larger one is neutral. Here in the US, black is hot, white is neutral, and green is ground. And by the way, I'm not an electrician, so don't do anything you see me doing. Because, you know, uh, internet and stuff. Okay, I think that should be good. Just get a little twist there to take up the slack. And let's see if we cut this too short. Actually, I think we might be good. Uh, it goes on. So we'll go like that. And then like that. And we'll start these in here. And looking down inside here, we've got enough cord remaining so that we can actually have the clamp work and the cable strain will do its job and stuff. I think that looks pretty good. All right, cool. I went ahead and grabbed one for the other end of the cord simply because if one side's bad, the other one probably is as well. But that thing wasn't getting hot and the terminals on it look fine. So I'm probably just gonna hang on to this for now. It's 102 degrees again outside. So yeah, we will wait till later to do that. All right, let me get this cleaned up and reconnect everything. Although I'm just now realizing the one cool feature of that other cord was the light in the end of it. I didn't even think about that when I was buying the replacement end. They had some with lights, but yeah, whatever. It's not a deal breaker. It was just really handy to have so I could look down here and see if the generator was uh, outputting any power or not. And the sun's starting to come out again, so I got our sunshade table right here. Yeah, the cord on this end is still looking good. Um, I checked uh, with a thermocammeter to see if anything was getting hot here, but it's mainly just on the other side. 
or the inside. Okay, let's uh, fire this thing back up. Okay, and judging from what we've learned yesterday, before I turn on the loads, I have to turn off the automatic throttle on this thing because the reaction time is not fast enough for this thing to recover from the voltage sag. Well, basically the transfer switch will disconnect before this thing recovers, so we gotta run the RPM up. And I could use a phone app to do it, or I could press this button right here. Once again, super reflective out here. Let's turn on our interior loads. Okay, that's connected. Now we'll turn on our battery charger. Okay, sitting here editing an update on the weather conditions. 102 outside, 86 sitting right here directly in front of the air conditioner. Which, by the way, if you saw the previous live stream, we looked at this little uh, atomizer humidifier thing, and that's actually been helping the air conditioner quite a bit. It adds just a fine mist of water for evaporative cooling going into there and uh, seems to help that thing out a bit. Anyways, um, how long is this video? Looks like we're at 25 minutes. I'm gonna take a break, get some coffee and or cold beverages. Then I think I just have to film the explanation of things and then cut and or print. Is that what you do with videos? I don't even know. It's hot in here. I'll be back. Well, barring any sort of uh, issues that may come up, this thing seems to be working pretty reliably. I just uh, keep moving this table to keep it in the shade. The only problem with this style of generator, as opposed to the one mounted to a power chair base, is someone can just walk by and grab this thing, and all they gotta do is pick it up and walk away. With the one on the power chair base, you gotta have some sort of vehicle, you have to figure out how to operate the chair, and the whole setup weighs like 700 pounds. This thing with fuel is like just under 60 pounds. So yeah, that is one thing to keep in mind, but it has been working pretty well. I originally had a piece of plywood underneath it because it looked like the air intake was on the bottom, but I later, later figured out that's not the case. Um, there's some rubber wheels on the back and a couple of rubber isolators in the front, but uh, yeah, it's been getting the job done. So anyways, this hot weather should be over soon, or at least get down into the 80s, and then uh, everything can go back to normal, and we shouldn't have to use this thing every day. But yeah, at night when I'm done, I shut the thing down, let it cool off, then I just basically lift it up, stick it into that bay right there, and uh, yeah, so anyways, sometimes going into debt is what you need to do, and it's getting the job done for sure. Okay, so... Why did you buy another generator? Don't you already have one? Well, the main answer to that, well, basically hot weather. We've been having a heat wave here in Portland. It was 110 the other day and 105 the day before that. And today it was 102 out here. The problem is it hasn't been cooling off at night. So you may be wondering, why don't you just run the air conditioner and then it will be cool in there? Well, here's the problem. The way everything was set up here in the bus was kind of a combination between stuff that's going to work reliably but not be too incredibly expensive. Some of it I plan to upgrade later, but I didn't want to do it in such a way so that I would immediately outgrow or need to replace the things that I did cheaply or, you know, with some cost savings in mind. Because getting this whole thing set up as a whole and getting everything functioning is a lot more important than bulletproofing every single system. So the way it works right now, I've got a 100 foot 10 gauge cord going over to city power. The maximum I can pull sustained from that is 1450 watts. Now if you stop and think about it, that's a microwave on its own, a toaster oven on its own, an air conditioner by itself. So what I have to do is basically use the inverter and the batteries that I have here in the bus as a buffer. 
So when I want to cook something, I hit a button, disconnect from the grid, then I've got 3,000 watts that I can use for the microwave and toaster oven and all that. Then once I'm done with that, I can turn the grid back on and the solar as well as the grid battery charger will top up that buffer in the batteries. Problem is during the day I'm running the air conditioner and just the air conditioner pulls my entire feed. So what I've been doing on days where it's only like 70 or 80 degrees outside, I run off the solar all day and that's no big deal. It keeps the batteries topped up enough to run the computer and the fridge and the ice maker in here and other little things. The amount of panels I have do not 100% cover my electrical use for the day though. That's partially because the angle that they're up there is not necessarily optimal. And realistically, probably two more panels up there would make things a lot more ideal. But the main issue is I'm using four lead acid batteries. They're basically group 34 AGM wheelchair batteries in a serious parallel configuration. And if you factor in the depth of discharge that lead acid batteries have, which is about 50%, I've only got about 60 amp hours of usable power. So, use the AC during the day, and about the time the sun goes down, it gets to a reasonable temperature outside, maybe 70, 65, something like that. I shut that thing off, open the hatches, get air moving through here and cool it down for the night. But the critical thing is, at the same time, I turn on the grid battery charger, because the solar isn't able to keep up with everything, and these batteries are starting to get kind of weak. I mean, they're not weak, but they don't have the same capacity that they did two years ago when I installed them. It, it's insane to think that I've been in here for two years now. But anyways, when it's hot outside and it doesn't cool down at night, I have to keep running the AC. And then if I do that, I can't charge the batteries overnight. And at nighttime, I have to be able to charge my chair and run my breathing machine as well as the fridge. So there's a lot of... Uh, spinning of plates and balancing and juggling and things like that and you know the last couple nights well the first night I realized I can't charge my chair I don't have enough electrical overhead to plug this thing in and I was like huh okay then the next day it was even hotter and I was like okay solution is run the generator during the day for all the loads inside here the solar will keep the batteries topped up and any sort of buffer activity like cooking I need to do no big deal well, because it's hot and because Portland and Oregon and everything is weird, and you'll never hear them say this on the news, but when fires magically start themselves, when there's no lightning and there's no down power lines, it's a thing that happens quite regularly. And when that happens, the power goes out. And also when it's hot, the power goes out. And on a normal October day, the power goes out. So the problem is I've got that one big generator. It's mounted to a wheelchair base. It works good. It's about 12 years old now. So it's good to have a backup anyways, but loading that thing in and out of the green van by myself every day is extremely difficult. So the idea behind this Ryobi generator was a portable one that I can lift. You know, it's, it's kind of a pain, but I can let the thing cool down, pick it up and set it in one of the luggage bays on the bus. It's got wheels on it, I can take it with me if I need to go somewhere. And, you know, it makes everything a lot easier for me. So, that's the idea. I don't know if that makes any sense. This video I was going to include all of the complicated electrical stuff that's going on in here, but we'll do that another time. It's, living in a bus is not easy. It's served my purpose for the last two years, and to be honest, I literally had no other option. I still don't at this point. Um, Parking somewhere in the shade would definitely help significantly. Um, then the AC in here would be able to keep up, but it's one of those deals. Yeah, I could just buy my way out of this situation. Get a couple of 200 amp hour, 24 volt lithium iron phosphate server rack batteries, maybe stick two more panels on the roof and also a roof AC unit, then I'd be set. But that costs money. And, you know, gotta work with what I have. And, you know, I was able to get this generator, which is nice making payments on it, which is why it's kind of frustrating that build quality is what it is these days, but I've been running that thing hard the last couple days and it's working good. So anyways, fluffy bunny rabbits and rainbows, happy thoughts and all that. Um, no major complaints other than trying not to broil. So anyways, hopefully you enjoyed and I will see you guys tomorrow on the live stream. Mm, coffee.